Hello, and welcome back to the Wolf's Den. We are the Order of the Green Hand, here to bring some clarity to A Song of Ice and Fire. In Bran 1, the very first chapter of the books, we meet Bran as he travels to see a deserter from the Night's Watch beheaded. He mentions someone named Rob, but we aren't given any real information about him. In fact, at this point, we still don't even know who Bran is yet. The very first character that we are formally introduced to is Mance Raider, the king beyond the wall. So what does this tell us right from the start? It tells the reader that Mance Raider is one of the most important characters in the books. In A Game of Thrones, Catelyn won. Catelyn expresses fear of this king beyond the wall, to which Ned replies, Mance Raider is nothing for us to fear. So, who is Mance Raider? Well, according to his story, he was born among the wildlings and was taken in by the Night's Watch as a child after the group of raiders he was with were put to the sword. He gained his name in remembrance of this fact. In time, he swore the vows of the Night's Watch, becoming a ranger, and was stationed at the Shadow Tower, where he became friends with Corrin and Halfhand. In A Game of Thrones, Bran 6, Osha tells Bran about Mance Raider and says something that completely contradicts his backstory. Giants and worse than giants, Lordling. I tried to tell your brother when he asked his questions. Him and your maester and that smiley boy Greyjoy. The cold winds are rising and men go out from their fires and never come back. Or, if they do, they're not men no more, but only whites with blue eyes and cold black hands. Why do you think I run south with Stiv and Hallie and the rest of them fools? Mance thinks he'll fight, the brave, sweet, stubborn man. Like the White Walkers were no more than rangers. But what does he know? He can call himself King Beyond the Wall all he likes but he's still just another old black crow who flew down from the shadow tower. He's never tasted winter. I was born up there, child, like my mother and her mother before her and her mother before her. Born of the free folk. We remember. So, Osha's statement completely contradicts Mance's backstory. We learn from Mance himself, as well as Corrin Halfhand, that Mance was born a wildling. But based on Osha's statement, it seems as though that's not what he's going around telling the wildlings, since she seems to think that he's just some crow who flew down from the Shadow Tower. And as Mance said, the crow's a tricksy bird. So which one of these stories is true and which is false? Well. Our money's on Mance telling the wildlings the truth. I mean, think about it. It would be much harder to sell the lie that you are a wildling to an actual wildling than to, say, someone south of the wall like John. This would be equivalent to, say, a guy in Cleveland who goes around telling everyone that he's from New York City, and he's not. The other people in Cleveland would most likely have no basis or experience to question him. But... If he happens to bump into someone who was born and raised in New York City, and they get to talking, the New Yorker is going to see through the lie in about 30 seconds. Additionally, she goes on to say that Mance has never tasted winter, which, based on Mance's age, is impossible if he was born north of the Wall, and then he grew up at the Wall, and then he became a ranger, which would require him to go beyond the Wall, regardless of the season. I admit, I'm no expert in Westerosi meteorology, but it seems to me that at his age, he would have seen at least two or three winters if that was the case. Then, she drives home the point that Mance is no wildling by saying, quote, I was born up there, like my mother and her mother before her, born of the free folk. That is flat out her drawing the distinction between her and Mance insinuating that he was not born beyond the wall, and that he quote-unquote knows nothing about winter. This leaves us with a few questions that need answering. 
Why is Mance Raider lying to the Night's Watch about his backstory? The Watch isn't exactly choosy. They pretty much take anyone. I mean, Yorin was bringing Rorge and Viter there. Furthermore, even if he was guilty of some crime before he got there, taking the Black absolves you of any wrongdoing. So why is he lying? The only reason we can think of for someone to take the Black and lie about who they truly are is if they want the rest of the world to think they're dead. Which begs another question. What would possess someone to fake their own death just to go take the Black? I mean, why wouldn't you just peace out to Essos, where no one would recognize you and you could do whatever you want? Mance is clearly a good fighter, so why wouldn't he just join one of the free companies and get rich or die trying? Instead, Mance decides to take the black, desert, and spend years trying to accomplish the impossible of uniting the wildlings, all so he could bring them south to aid in the fight against the White Walkers. That sounds like a man with a plan, not just another old black crow who flew down from the Shadow Tower, who became an oath breaker because he fancied wildling women in music. But we'll get back to that in a minute because there's another question that needs answering first. Why did Quarren Halfhand help spread Mance's lie? In A Clash of Kings, John 7, Corrin and John have a conversation that we believe is the key to understanding why. John had just let Eager get away from him without killing her, like the Halfhand said, and John was explaining what happened, and he said, She even claimed we were kin. She told me a story, Halfhand interrupted and said, of Bale the Bard in the Rose of Winterfell. So Stonesnake told me. It happens I know the song. Mance would sing it of old when he came back from arranging. He had a passion for wildling music, aye, and for their women. You knew him, John said? And then he realized they were friends as well as brothers, and now they are sworn foes. Why did he desert, he asked. For a wench, some say, for a crown others would have it. Corrin tested the edge of his sword with the ball of his thumb. He liked women, Mance did, and he was not a man whose knees bent easily. That's true. But there was more to it than that. He loved the wild better than the wall. It was in his blood. He was wildling born, taken as a child when some raiders were put to the sword. When he left the Shadow Tower... He was only going home again. Was he a good ranger? John asked. He was the best of us, said the half-hand, and the worst as well. Only fools like Thor and Smallwood despise the wildlings. They are brave as we are, John, as strong, as quick, as clever. But they have no discipline. They name themselves the free folk, and each one thinks himself as good as a king and wiser than a maester. Mance was the same. He never learned how to obey. No more than me, John said quietly. Now, you might be asking yourself, what was so significant about that conversation? At a quick glance, it appears that Corrin is just educating John, and us the reader, on the enemy, Mance Raider. But when you look a little closer, there's actually quite a bit more. As John listens to Corrin talk about Mance, he realizes they were friends as well as brothers. Now, most people assume this is just a reference to them being brothers of the Night's Watch, but we believe there is actually a double meaning here. As stated in our previous videos, we believe that the three Kingsguard from the Tower of Joy are alive and have been working with several key characters since that time in preparation for the wars to come. I'm not going to go through all the evidence here, but I want to highlight one tidbit that is mentioned at the end of our Mysteries, Myths, and Motives, Rhaegar and Lyanna's Greatest Deception video, to sort of set the stage. In Ned's fever dream, his companions appear as gray wraiths on horses made of mist. These were the faces of men he had known as well as his own once, faces he had sworn never to forget. This stands in contrast to the faces of the Kingsguard, whose faces in his dream, quote, 
burn clear even now. We believe that the reason Ned can still recall the faces of the Kingsguard, and not those of his own men, is because the Kingsguard didn't actually die at the Tower of Joy, as is commonly believed. It is our belief that Corn Halfhand is really Oswell Went, and Mance Raider is really Arthur Dane, making them both sworn brothers of the Kingsguard as well. Interestingly, the vows sworn by the Kingsguard were modeled after those of the Night's Watch. In both cases, the men promised to take no wives, father no children, and hold no titles. Furthermore, their oaths hold them responsible for the defense of the realm. Now going back to Corrin and Mance. Corrin says Mance was not a man whose knees bent easily. Now, if that sounds familiar, it should. In Ned's fever dream about the Tower of Joy, he begins listing all the likely places that he thought he would find the three Kingsguard, one of which was Storm's End. Ned tells them that the Tyrells and all their vassals bent the knee and pledged fealty to Robert. Arthur Dane then replied, Our knees do not bend easily. Well, knees not bending easily is something that is actually only referenced twice in the entire Song of Ice and Fire series. And if that's not enough of a parallel for you, on more than one occasion, Mance Raider straight up tells John, We do not kneel. So, why do we believe that Corrin is Oswell? Well, for one, John notes that he is clean-shaven, which stands in stark contrast to other Knights' watchmen. However, the Kingsguard from Eris's reign were all known to be clean-shaven men. Additionally, throughout John's journey with the Half-Hand, Corrin is constantly honing his longsword with a whetstone. Well, if you look back at the Tower of Joy passage, that is exactly what Oswell Went was doing. He also stands and sits straight as a spear, which indicates a high level of pride that is most closely associated with being highborn. Also, John calls him my lord more than once, which is not something he does often, at least not to men who clearly hold no land or titles. Lastly, Another interesting statement that can be taken from this passage is the way that John compares himself to Mance, in that both he and Mance never learn to obey. Well, if John is really Ashara Dane's son, and Mance is really Arthur Dane, this could be a subtle way that George R. R. Martin is beginning to draw a parallel between John and his uncle, the Sword of the Morning. So... If Corn is really Oswell, and Mance is really Arthur, that means they go back way farther than just serving together at the Night's Watch. They were brothers as Kingsguard, and friends and confidants to Rhaegar Targaryen, making John's realization that they were friends, as well as brothers, even more poignant. That being said, it also explains why Corrin would help spread Mance's false backstory, and also clears up why George R. R. Martin went out of his way to tell us through Yorin, that Lady Went is a good friend to the Watch, even though they never went to Harrenhal, no pun intended. After all, if Mance is outed as Arthur Dane, people may begin to question his best friend at the Watch, who has a remarkably similar fighting style and skill set. And, as Gerald Hightower said, the Kingsguard does not flee, then or now. So, let's look at Corn Halfhand's actions in the Clash of Kings and see if they line up with our theory and Gerald's statement that the Kingsguard does not flee. As the men of the Night's Watch assemble beyond the wall, Corrin informs Mormont that Mance is gathering his strength in the Frostfangs in search of something he needs, and he then requests that he be given leave to go investigate further. Reluctantly, Mormont agrees and tells Corrin to choose his men. And almost on cue, Corrin says, I choose Jon Snow. So Corrin Halfhand, Jon Snow, and their small party set out to scout the Skirling Pass in search of the wildlings. As a quick aside, we believe that Squire Dalridge, 
one of the men traveling with them, described as an aged man known for his keen eyes and skill with the bow, is very likely one of the raven's teeth who followed Brendan Rivers to the wall when he was sent there by Aegon V Targaryen. Following Ghost being attacked by Oral's eagle, Corrin says they need to leave immediately, as they have been spotted. Interestingly, soon after that, John sees a pair of glowing eyes as big as Harvest Moons on the ledge overhead. Harvest Moons are golden in color. Who do we know north of the Wall who are renowned for their big golden eyes? Yeah, the children of the forest. To us, this insinuates that what Corrin meant is that they had been spotted by the true enemy, the children. When they're almost back to the place where John captured Egret earlier, they become aware that they are being pursued by a group of wildlings, and Corrin looks to Squire Dalbridge and says, One man could hold a hundred from here, the right man. In turn, the squire bows his head dutifully and ask that they give his horse an apple when they get home. And in that moment, John realizes he's staying here to die. This would mean that Squire Dalbridge, a man so loyal to Bloodraven he followed him to the wall, is equally dedicated to stopping the children of the forest. So much so that he was willing to sacrifice his own life so that Corrin and Jon Snow would have a chance at getting away safely. This lends credence to the idea that Squire Dalbridge knew that one or both of them have a role to play in what is likely Bloodraven's plan to win the war with the Children of the Forest once more. To us, this means that Squire Dalbridge very likely saw John as playing a role in the wars to come. Just as Corrin tells Eben, not long after leaving Dalbridge to contend with the Wildlings. When the Wildlings sound their horn, Signaling the end of Squire Dalbridge, Corrin realizes that they are caught, and orders Eben to go find Mormont and tell him that the old powers are waking, that he faces giants and wargs and worse. Tell him the trees have eyes again. Eben refuses, stating that he should send John, to which Corrin replied, John has a different part to play. Corrin wanting Mormont to know that the trees have eyes again furthers the notion that he sees the children as the true enemy, since it is the children who were known to spy on men through the eyes of the Weirwoods, which prompted the first men to begin cutting them down, causing the first war with the children thousands of years ago. Corrin's understanding of this situation speaks volumes. Think about it. John can't even convince the rest of the men of the Night's Watch that the Wildlings aren't the true enemy, and that keeping the Wildlings beyond the Wall only serves to add a hundred thousand whites to the army of the dead. So, Corrin stands leagues apart from the clowns John is surrounded by at the Wall, and that he seems to possess an understanding of the situation that very few others have. In fact, when Corrin says to tell Mormont that the trees have eyes again, John didn't even seem to catch it. In fact, we know that John is ignorant to the connection between the children and the White Walkers because we're in his head, and as it turned out, Eager was right. He knows nothing. But in all seriousness, the point we're trying to make here is Corrin seems to be one of very few who are aware of the link between the children of the forest and the White Walkers and therefore is much, much more than just some ranger from the Shadow Tower. He's the guy that's been working with his brothers at arms since the day Robert's Rebellion ended to ensure the realm is ready for the real war to come. While hiding in a cave in the hopes of evading the wildlings' pursuit, Corrin tells John, The fire will soon go out, but if the wall should ever fall, all the fires will go out. And then he says, If we are taken, you must yield. Yield? John asked. He blinked in disbelief. The wildlings did not make captives of the men they called the crows. They killed them. Except for... They only spare oathbreakers, John said. Those who join them, 
like Mance Raider. And you, Corn replied. No, John shook his head. Never, I won't. You will, Corn said. I command it of you. Command it? But... Our honor means no more than our lives, so long as the realm is safe. Are you a man of the Night's Watch? The last order given to John by Corrin Halfhand was, You must not balk, whatever is asked of you. And then he asks him, Is your sword sharp, John Snow? It wasn't until it was already happening that John realized what these orders truly meant. As we all know, the wildlings would only take John if he killed the Halfhand. John did not balk. And as the big ranger lay dying, he thought, he knew. He knew what they would ask of me. So in this video, we referenced two characters with a plan, Bloodraven and Mance Raider, who, interestingly, dons a great bronze and iron helm with raven wings at both temples, which, when taken together, seem to be reminiscent of two very important legends from history. During times of war, the gardener kings of old donned crowns made of bronze and iron. And, more simply, raven's wings are symbolically tied to blood raven. Gardener kings were known to have warred against the children of the forest and the ironborn, and we believe Blood Raven has been pulling strings from afar for decades in order to ensure that the realm was ready for the real war to come, the war with the children. This leads us to believe that they are working together to prepare for the next battle for the dawn. We also believe that the children of the forest and the faceless men are allied in achieving their common goal, which is all men must die. We aren't going to delve into the details here because the full narrative is going to require a series of videos. But until then, here's a tip of the iceberg. When Arya first arrives at the house of black and white, the face the kindly man is wearing just so happens to perfectly match the face of Blood Raven, who we believe is a captive of the children of the forest. Also, the first time we are introduced to the phrase, all men must die, is not by Jack and Hagar, but actually by several characters John meets when he is beyond the wall. However, it's not until A Storm of Swords, Tyrion 9, where we learn the true meaning of this seemingly benign phrase of old from Oberyn Martell. Valar Margulis was how they said it in Valyria of old. All men must die. And the doom came and proved it true. So it would seem that all men must die holds a much more sinister meaning. This brings us back to Corrin. Corrin knows that the true enemy is coming. The enemy John saw watching with two glowing eyes as big as harvest moons. The eyes of the children of the forest. This adds new meaning to Corrin's statement to John that our honor means no more than our lives so long as the realm is safe. In the author's annotations of the iBook version of A Clash of Kings, George R. R. Martin likens the half-hand's view to Jaime Lannister's situation during Robert's Rebellion, where he couldn't find his way through his many conflicting vows. Just like the Kingsguard, the men of the Night's Watch swear vows as part of their joining. But Corn Halfhand's view is that the Sworn Brothers ultimately serve to protect the realm, and if a vow gets in the way of that service, better to break the vow than forsake the kingdom. A perspective, we believe, would be held by the finest knight Ned Stark ever saw, Sir Arthur Dane, the Sword of the Morning, or as we know him, Mance Raider, the King Beyond the Wall. And that's what we're going to tell you about in part two. So... Stay tuned, like, and subscribe for more clarity on A Song of Ice and Fire, brought to you by the Order of the Green Hand.